John Barry remembers the exact moment he gave up his boyhood dream of doing medical research for his other boyhood dream of writing. He was 13 years old and had returned from summer camp, eager to examine some bacterial cultures he had grown and left in the freezer, only to find it gone. Hello, everyone. I'm Chitra Raghavan. Welcome to When It Mattered. This episode is brought to you by Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups with strategic brand positioning and narrative. Little did he know it at the time, but after a long detour away from his childhood love for medical research, Barry would write an award-winning book on science and medicine called The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. The acclaimed book positioned him to give timely history, context, and framing for the COVID-19 pandemic when it exploded on the world stage last year. The crisis of pandemics and how to deal with them would largely take over Barry's life. I'm joined now by John M. Barry, prize-winning and New York Times best-selling author of six books, two of which, The Great Influenza and Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America, have pulled Barry into various policy advising roles with state, federal, United Nations, and World Health Organization officials on influenza, water-related disasters, and risk communication. Barry is currently a distinguished scholar at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in New Orleans. John, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me. You were pretty serious about medical research even when you were 11. How did that start? Yeah, I was just fascinated by it. Uh, I was one of those kids that had a lab in their home. Uh, you know, I actually had a pretty good quality, though ancient microscope, I had lights, lenses, and things like that, a Spencer microscope, uh, you know, grew my own media, you know, agar agar and uh, all these dyes. And I was playing with E. coli, which can kill you, but seemed pretty tame because I could use that in my school classes. So I figured if it was school, it was one very exciting. And I sent away to the American Bacteriological Supply House in Washington, DC. I actually remember uh, the company's name don't exist anymore. And I asked for some uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And of course, today, if you did that, you the uh, all sorts of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you get a knock on the door from the FBI. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they uh, figured anybody who asked for it must be qualified to use it. So they sent it to me. And uh, I had fun growing that and playing with it and so forth and so on. And uh, went away to camp. Uh, it came dehydrated in a vial. I hadn't used all of it. I put what was left uh, in the freezer so that I could reconstitute my cultures when I returned from camp. When I came back, I opened the freezer, asked my parents, well, where's my staff? Uh, and uh, they explained that their friend, a physician and family physician, they had mentioned it to him, and he had said, you, you nuts. He threw it out and then wrote a blistering letter to the company that had sent it to me, so they'd never send me anything again. And I was, I was really furious. I'm, I'm still mad about it, as a matter of fact. I was as angry as you can get when you're 13 years old, which is pretty, pretty angry. And I had always been torn between a desire to write and a desire to do medical research. And at that moment in time, I actually said, okay, um, I'm done with uh, the research. I'm, I'm going to be a writer. Uh, and as you said in the introduction, uh, <laughs> eventually I, I did write about science, although that I don't consider myself primarily a science writer. I have done several books that are, I guess, fairly technical though. But it would be a while before you fulfilled your dream of becoming a writer. You you did history, I guess, in graduate school and, and then dropped out and became a football coach. So first of all, why history? And then why did you drop out of college and, and start focusing on football? Well, history is pretty easy. Both, both the answer to both questions is pretty easy. You know, I think history encompasses every field of uh, 
both human endeavor and, and natural and events. So it seemed to be the, the best way to try to understand the world. Uh, in terms of football, I, I love the game. I wasn't very good at it as a player. I sat on the bench in college in a, a poor team in the Ivy League. So it wasn't exactly big time football. I was kind of frustrated by that experience. I didn't want to leave the game that way. So as you said, I did drop out of grad school in history. I was pursuing a PhD and, and did coach for a few years. Uh, I never intended to do that for the rest of my life. But it would lead you to writing because your first piece was sold to a coaching magazine. And I guess you went from there to journalism, uh, right? And then to writing your book. Well, that, that's true. I wouldn't say exactly that it led me to writing, but it, it, the first, actually the first three stories that I ever got published or paid for were all in a magazine called Scholastic Coach. One was about a uh, system to change your blocking assignments at the line of scrimmage. One was maximizing the use of your the tight end. And one was about what, uh, off-season training. You know, I already considered, you know, was attempting to write. And as you say, I did uh, end up covering uh, national politics and economic policy in, in Washington, uh, D.C. for um, not quite 10 years left a job on a magazine to uh, finish my first book, which was on politics called The Ambition and the Power, uh, True Story of Washington, and, uh, and then never went back to a regular job after that. Wow, that's amazing. And, and so what led you to write uh, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history? I mean, tell us briefly what the book is about and how you decided to write it. Uh, you weren't particularly interested in writing it at, in the beginning. No, I actually planned to write a book on the home front in World War I, culminating in the events of 1919, which I consider one of the most interesting years in American history. A lot of things happened in 1919 and during the war, of course. But the way I conceived of that book, I thought it would take me at least seven years to write. And I live entirely on my writing, which means in advance. And if you say it all at once, the, the amount of money needed to live decently for seven years, uh, plus pay research expenses, that's a lot. It sounds like a lot of money. Uh, and that book idea I didn't think was going to generate that kind of an advance. So I thought I could write a book on the pandemic in at most two and a half years and probably less than that. And it would subsidize the larger book I got what's a pretty hefty advance for a book you could write in two years. Uh, unfortunately, the influenza book ended up taking me seven years. <laughs> the same amount of money divided by seven is a lot less than <laughs> when it's divided by two. Uh, so I was kind of looking like at life like a graduate student almost. I was pretty old to be doing that toward the end of that book. Uh, and it was not a labor of love uh, at the beginning. For the first five and a half years, I wanted to throw the whole thing out practically every day and abandon it. Um, but uh, character in the book, Oswald Avery, um, actually kept me inspired, um, his persistence. Um, and he's probably the uh, single person most deserving of the Nobel Prize who never won it. He was being uh, considered for the Nobel Prize for his lifelong contribution to immunology when he came out with a paper that said DNA carried the genetic code, which was extremely controversial at the time. So because so, since most people didn't believe it, he was right. So they didn't give him the prize. And of course, he was right. Uh, in the book, I quote about five or six Nobel laureates, including Jim Watson, Peter Medawar, Salvador Lurie, McFarlane Burnett, all saying Avery was key. He basically launched the entire field of molecular biology, but he never got the prize. At any rate, Avery struggled with that paper for 25 years, trying to solve the problem, which ended up in that conclusion. 
and and knowing what he went through uh, did kind of keep me going. Uh, and, and as I said, for five and a half years, it was hell almost every day. But it then came together in the last year and a half. Things worked out pretty well. And uh, obviously, the you know, the book, fortunately, uh, you know, I'm quite proud of it. It, it um, you know, both in the scientific community and commercially, it was, you know, pretty, did pretty well. And it, and it had all kinds of good ramifications for you. It, it kind of pulled you into the policy world, didn't it? It did. Uh, you know, it came out by coincidence, uh, to, you know, a year after SARS, right around the time H5N1, so-called bird flu uh, surfaced, and after, of course, 9-11. And the Bush administration uh, was very concerned about pandemic preparedness. And I, again, I've been told by many people in position to know that the book actually was useful in terms of actually getting a $7 billion piece of legislation passed for preparedness. In fact, uh, the secretary of HHS, Mike Levitt, apparently read portions of it to a handful of key senators uh, in a meeting, and they went out the next day and took over the floor. So I've been told quite recently by a pretty senior person who was there. You scared the heck out of them. Apparently. But, and anyway, the uh, at the same time, a lot of the planning, you know, they, was based on analyzing what happened in 1918. And since I knew about that, I was asked to get involved in, in the early days of those planning meetings, sort of conceptualizing uh, how to respond to a pandemic. And, you know, it was intellectually challenging and uh, fun. I enjoyed it. So I was very happy to participate in, in that and been involved in that issue ever since, really. Yeah, and it really has uh, the, the timing and the, the sense of uh, historic context must have been quite eerie for you when you started to see COVID-19 evolve. Uh, what were your thoughts when you first started reading about it? Did you start to sort of make those connections between the all of the things you had written about with the great influenza and what you were seeing emerging with COVID-19? Well, yeah, they're hard to miss, really. Um, I mean, there are a lot of differences. There are also a tremendous number of similarities. And, you know, understanding what had happened, the way the virus in 1918 had moved, you know, it, it did, I think, give me some help in understanding what might happen this time. Um, you know, even in January uh, of 2020, it seemed apparent to me that that virus was going to be a pandemic. COVID-19 would, would be a pandemic. Uh, you know, I wrote a piece, a working title of which was this virus cannot be contained, which ran in January in the Washington Post. It just seemed so obvious. Uh, I couldn't understand why other people weren't seeing it. I mean, obviously some were, but but too many weren't. Um, you know, and based on what happened in 1918, I guess in April, I, I wrote another piece saying that summer was not going to provide relief. You know, a lot, I think the virus is a seasonal virus, but in, in that under normal circumstances, summer uh, do, does help contain the virus, you know, heat and humidity and so forth. The virus doesn't do that well in it as it does in, in other temperatures. Uh, but so much of the population of the United States during the summer was still susceptible. I thought that was much more important than the fact that the temperature was going up. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that prediction proved true. But, you know, that was based on historical evaluation. Uh, the so-called, you know, the social distancing, the hand washing, ventilation, all those things were uh, used in 1918. Um, and analyses of cities that that did more of them, did them earlier and so forth, you know, demonstrated that they were effective somewhat at any rate in 1918. And, 
you know, that's, I mean, models suggest they did it as well, but having that historical precedent, um, all those things uh, combined to make them the policy of the preparedness plans, of course, you got to execute the policies. I think the single biggest lesson coming out of 1918, uh, however, was that you need to tell the truth. Uh, if you're going to get the public to comply with your recommendations, they have to want to comply. And they're not going to do that unless they believe you. Uh, and the truth is absolutely crucial to get that public acceptance. And that wasn't happening for a while. Not in the United States. Uh, you know, there obviously are countries around the world where that worked very well. And, you know, a lot of countries have been very much more successful uh, than the United States. Some of them have all but eliminated the virus. Uh, you know, the containment has been extraordinary. A lot of countries have done better than the United States, most of them, frankly. Uh, a few have done even worse. But I think if you look across borders, the ones that have done well, that were not totalitarian countries, have told the truth. And that that was very important as to part of their plan. You know, transparency is very high in the pandemic preparedness plan that was prepared by the United States very high priority, the highest priority, really. It's the same in every state plan, all of which are modeled after the federal plan. But as a football coach would say, you got to execute. And we didn't execute. And you've been, uh, you've been doing a lot of public speaking. You've been writing on this. You've been educating people at all levels. And, uh, and you've been doing a, a, a bit of policy work as well, advising the administrations on this. Tell, tell us a little bit about some of that work that you've been doing and has your message been heard? Well, not this administration, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, the Bush administration, uh, yeah, I did get uh, pretty involved. Um, we've already talked about the, the preparation of, I mean, the whole planning process uh, and development of policy over how to deal with the pandemic. In 2009, um, I got pretty involved, not in an official way, I guess, but pretty involved uh, with the response from the Obama administration uh, to H1N1, the so-called swine flu. Um, you know, some people on the National Security Council and I were pretty friendly and we would talk quite often. Uh, one thing that was interesting back then was scientists around the world were sending me kind of fairly significant information. Uh, and I would forward that to my friends in the White House. And, you know, they're pretty busy. At one point I was asking them, did they want me to keep sending this stuff? Because, you know, it takes time to open an email. And, and was it worth it? Uh, and they responded, oh, yes, please do, because I was giving them information that they were not getting through official channels for weeks sometimes, uh, whereas I was giving it to them in real time. So those official channels are not always very good movers of information. I think we've uh, discovered that uh, again this time, uh, you know, the way information has flowed to the World Health Organization from China, for example, not exactly timely and, and not exactly uh, with total candor, so-called transparency. I don't really like the word transparency, but everybody else uses it, so I guess I might as well. You're a New Orleans resident. You've experienced the violence and destruction of Katrina, and you've also been deeply involved in water issues and policymaking around flood protection. And that rose in part out of your third book, Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America. 
how did that uh, work uh, that you did on Katrina come about? Well, the ri rising tide was about a, a flood that nobody ever heard of, really, uh, in 1927. The Mississippi River is the biggest disaster in American history, natural disaster in American history. Uh, it flooded just about 1% of the entire population of the country. Um, killed people from uh, Virginia to Oklahoma, um, all of which is in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, it elected Hoover president. It changed the way people thought about the federal government uh, and its responsibilities toward individual citizens. And, and in terms of percentage of GDP, it was five times the impact of Hurricane Sandy um, and significantly larger than the impact of Katrina. Uh, so huge event, even though most people, unless they live close to the Mississippi River, had never heard of it. Uh, you know, that book did come out. Uh, that also, you know, fortunately won some awards. Uh, and in uh, Louisiana, it was, you know, a huge bestseller. And nationally, it wasn't quite as big, although actually it, it did actually, you know, make the bestseller list. And so I was pretty well known in Louisiana. And after the storm, the congressional delegation uh, on a bipartisan basis asked me to chair a working group on, on flood protection. Um, and then the state passed a cast constitutional amendment to create a uh, new levy board uh, for Metro New Orleans. And I was asked to serve on that, which I did. This was an extraordinary board. Uh, levy boards normally are highly political and they spend some money, so they, they have resources. Uh, but they're all localized. Whereas we had on it from California, the, the head of floodplain management for the state of California, who had before that been the chief engineer for California's levy system. We had from North Carolina, uh, the chair of a working National Academy of Sciences working group on coastal risk reduction. We had the past president of the American Society of Civil Engineers who was, happened to be uh, local in New Orleans. Uh, had a guy who wrote college textbooks on engineering. Uh, this was really an extraordinary board. We, we were determined to try to protect the city as well as we could. And Louisiana has lost 2,000 square miles of land. Coastal Louisiana just melted into the ocean. That's equal to the state, bigger than the state of Delaware. Uh, and one of the main causes of this was oil and gas uh, production on the, in the coastal lands. Uh, and without this, those lands serve as a buffer. Uh, you know, if you put the state of Delaware between New Orleans and the ocean, you wouldn't need any levees at all. So while our primary task for this board was to try to oversee the new levee system that was being built and make sure that it was uh, done properly and make some suggestions where possible or were needed. Uh, because I, I hope your listeners understand just to back up for a second. The levee system that existed before Katrina was designed to hold a storm like Katrina. It should have held that storm. Uh, the levees that flooded the city that are actually flood walls, not levees, technically. Uh, they were not over top. The water never came within two feet of the top of those levees. They just collapsed because they were not well designed. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that things were done right. But looking out to the longer term to protect the city, we recognize that we had to restore uh, some of that land that was lost. And that's very expensive. The oil industry by its own studies is responsible for roughly a third of the land loss. Other people think it's a lot higher, but the industry's own studies put it at a third. 
So we did something extremely controversial in the state of Louisiana. Uh, uh, we filed a lawsuit uh, against 97 oil and gas and pipeline companies uh, seeking uh, their help in restoring this land. Uh, it, it did spark quite a political battle in the state legislature and gubernatorial campaign campaigns and things like that. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, no, our case was dismissed. Uh, we did take it to the Supreme Court. We, we never got to trial. It was dismissed beforehand. The claim was that we didn't have any standing to file the lawsuit. However, we did spark uh, lawsuits by uh, several parishes, counties, and you can call counties parishes in Louisiana. Uh, which explicitly do have standing in the law and a whole host of private landowner lawsuits. Uh, all of those are proceeding. There has been a settlement in theory worked out between one company, Freeport McMoran, and uh, uh, the parishes but it's not, that requires legislation and all sorts of things to go uh, forward before that settlement can be truly worked out. Uh, so it's not clear whether that will be resolved. And if so, whether it will be a model for the other companies that, that would have to come forward with a lot more money than Freeport Magmarin um, has agreed to do. So I guess your, your popularity as a writer was a little bit offset by your lack of popularity as somebody who's suing 97 oil, gas, and pipeline companies. I don't know. I was accused, in fact, uh, in the state legislature of filing the lawsuit for the sole purpose of having a book to write about. That They actually said that. I, I mean, uh, I was just trying to look for a subject. Uh, there were, I mean, there's... Ah, well, you know, West Virginia and coal, Louisiana and oil. There used to be a saying I guess, that the uh, flag of Texaco flies atop the state capital in Louisiana. Uh, of course, Texaco doesn't exist anymore. Part of Exxon, I guess, or Chevron, rather. Yeah, I mean, you live, I guess you live in the French Quarter, right, in New Orleans, and you've... I mean, between Katrina and, and you know, COVID-19 shutting down like all the restaurants and bars and music and culture, you've, you've seen it all, haven't you? It, it, what was that like, I mean, to, to see all of that unfold? Well, obviously pretty depressing. <laughs> you know, in Katrina, we had water in our street, but it didn't get above the curb. I, of course, I have friends who lost everything. So I had kind of survivor guilt. The, the French Quarter was a desolate place a year ago at this time. You know, there's a hotel next to me that had, it's very depressing, you know, a large driveway. They put plywood over the driveway, you know. So, uh, and normally it's so active down here and to see nothing, I'm, Probably everybody uh, listening can remember pictures of Beijing with these, you know, massive road systems that are about 12 or 14 lanes wide that don't have anything moving on it. That was kind of like the French Quarter in New Orleans. Uh, my wife and I would, would walk around every day. Uh, there was one guy that used to play bagpipes a few blocks away. And, you know, that's a pretty haunting sound. So, of course, everyone has gone through something like that uh, in the past year. Um, not fun. Yeah. And what do you think is going to happen next? I mean, are we actually going to be able to open? You're seeing all these variants and, you know, there's this kind of uh, struggle politically and socially and culturally between opening up, should we open up, you know, we have to mask, we have to get vaccinated. 
What's your prediction, knowing everything you know about these things? Well, you know, I do follow it pretty closely. I'm writing a book about it. I'm, you know, I, I knew several members of Biden's advisory committee. Uh, you know, a, a couple of them were friends. Uh, I knew a couple of others. So I'm reasonably plugged in and, you know, even, uh, you know, the variants are a real concern, uh, but I'm optimistic. You know, in 1918, there was a first wave that was not at all lethal. I'll give you one example. There were 40,000 French soldiers hospitalized, sick enough to be hospitalized. Fewer than 100 died. That's, that's pretty mild, particularly back then when you didn't have any uh, antibiotics and really not a lot of things you could do in terms of medical care. That virus mutated. Uh, the, other, the other thing about that first wave was it was not particularly... I mean, it was contagious, sure, but, but it had a tendency to peter out, uh, not nearly as contagious as it became. So a, a variant of that initial virus emerged, and when it did, uh, it was highly contagious, and it also was much more lethal, much deadlier. And that's sort of what's happening now. Fortunately, it's nothing like the difference in 1918, but these new variants, they are significantly more transmissible. Uh, you know, the original uh, wild virus was extraordinarily transmissible, much more transmissible than influenza. Influenza, seasonal influenza has a reproductive number about 1.28. 1918 was probably about 1.8 and the initial virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, was 2.5 to 3. So that's much more transmissible than influenza, much more transmissible than the 1918 pandemic. Uh, and the variants are roughly 50% more transmissible than the original wild virus. So the real concern is that they well, that's a pretty big concern, just the numbers. But in addition, they are more lethal. Not like the difference in 1918 between the first and second wave, which were orders of magnitude. But there was a study saying that the B117, the UK variant, was, I think the number was 64% more lethal than the virus it replaced. Uh, the other variants, the numbers aren't really clear, but they seem also to be uh, more deadly than the virus the, that they are replacing. Now, that is still not an order of magnitude higher uh, as 1918 was, but it's worrisome. Uh, they do seem uh, to be vulnerable to the vaccine, all of the variants. My real concern is the variants that we have not seen yet the possibility that a really nasty version of SARS-CoV-2 could be out there and could develop. You know, obviously, we have some very effective vaccines. I uh, give you a sense of uh, just how effective, you know, the best influenza vaccine we ever had was 62% effective. You were 62% less likely to get the disease. Normally, they're about 40% effective for influenza. So these vaccines came in at the 90% level. Uh, and even ones that are, that are a little bit less, the 70% level. And they've all proven to be 100% effective in preventing severe disease, you know, defined as admission to uh, an ICU. Uh, or might even be hospital. I forgot the precise definition. So as everybody listening, if you've listened this far, you're probably interested in COVID. And then you know we are in a race to get enough people vaccinated before the variants really take hold 
and, and spread widely or and also to prevent the emergence of a really nasty variant. You know, I do think we are in the United States, you know, just about dead even with the variants, maybe slightly ahead. Uh, so we have a chance of winning that race in the United States. Um, if we do that, if a really nasty variant doesn't emerge, then I would think you're going to have a lot of football stadiums with some pretty big crowds in the fall. Uh, but worldwide, you know, the, the virus is going to continue to mutate. Uh, it is possible you get a really nasty version of it that emerges somewhere or could emerge in the United States, could emerge anywhere, or it may never emerge. Uh, but it's not over yet. You know, it's certainly in the self-interest of ourselves to make sure that the rest of the world gets plenty of vaccine and gets it fast. In wrapping up, John, looking back at that 13-year-old boy uh, back from camp, angry at having lost his uh, culture that he was looking forward to playing with and deciding to become a writer on the spot and looking back at your rich career since as a historian, coach, uh, influenza and pandemic expert, environmental activist, policy advisor, what would you say to that 13-year-old about the incredible journey that you've been on? Uh, <laughs> I'm not very clever, so I don't, you know, just keep on trucking. <laughs> uh, you know, do what interests you and what you're curious about and what, what drives you, you know, um, hardly an original thought, but it's not so much pursue your dream, but, you know, work hard and have, an, have a goal um, and pursue it. And do you have any any what I call viral insights in the wake of COVID-19, that moment of clarity brought upon by a crisis? Not really. The, 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 I guess a moment of clarity is more a moment of incomprehensibility uh, and what so overwhelming in this whole thing is the incompetence of the response of the Trump administration. You know, anybody, everybody in public health, everybody who knows anything about pandemics is so frustrated, furious, depressed, because there are hundreds of thousands of people in the United States who should be alive. And practically on a daily basis, you just shake your head in disbelief over how poorly this was handled in the United States. Nobody that I know of in the community uh, ever imagined something like a mask could be politicized could we imagine that some people wouldn't want to wear them? Yes. But could we imagine that it would be part of a partisan political fight? No. You know, that's sort of the clearest thing that comes through whenever I think of COVID-19 is that so many hundreds of thousands of people in this country should be alive who are dead. John, thank you so much for joining me on When It Mattered. Thank you. John M. Barry is a prize-winning and acclaimed New York Times best-selling author whose books have won multiple awards. His books include The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History, and Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 and How It Changed America. Barry's writing has received not only a slew of major awards, but less formal recognition as well. A 2004 GQ named Rising Tide one of nine pieces of writing essential to understanding America. That list also included Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address and Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. 
Barry's first book, The Ambition and the Power, A True Story of Washington, was cited by the New York Times as one of the 11 best books ever written about Washington and the Congress. His book, The Transformed Cell, Unlocking the Mysteries of Cancer, co-authored with Dr. Steve Rosenberg, was published in 12 languages. And a story about football that he wrote was selected for inclusion in an anthology of the best football writing of all time, published in 2006 by Sports Illustrated. You can read more about John Barry and his incredible body of work at johnmbarry.com. This is When It Mattered. I'm Chitra Raghavan. When It Mattered is a podcast from Good Story, an advisory firm helping technology startups with brand strategy, positioning, and narrative. Our producer is Jeremy Kaur, founder and CEO of Executive Podcasting Solutions, with production assistance from Kate Cruz. Our creative advisor is Adi Weinland, and our research and logistics lead is Sarah Muller. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. And if you like the show, please rate it five stars, leave a review, and do recommend it to your friends, family, and colleagues. For questions, comments, and transcripts, please visit our website at goodstory.io or send us an email at podcast at goodstory.io. Join us next week for another episode of When It Mattered. I'll see you then.